super happy to bring Jason and his collaborators, who I'll introduce formally in a minute here, just to set the context. Uh, you may remember that we had a prior talk on the IRA and what was in the IRA. That was uh, Ted Fertig and Tim Sahe came and did that at the start of the semester. So it was great to have Jason and his colleagues bookend this on the other side. If you're interested in this stuff at all, there is the kind of internal American debate about sort of industrial policy, the IRA, green transition, etc. There's sometimes a sort of a, a comparative bit to this conversation. If you get involved in the more general conversations in this research area, there tends to be a sort of, uh, yes, what are the European up to, right? And there's this kind of interest in the fact that the Europeans have better politics but seem unable to actually deliver on it, where at the same time the Americans have shitty politics but nonetheless seem to be able to deliver at least in the moment a bit more. So there's that. Where's China in the conversation? Right? If there's any country in the world that is actually doing this and doing it at scale, it is China. And there's a lot of misconceptions about how China does this. There seems to be this kind of neuralgia that we do this through three market mechanisms, but we actually do it through bribery and bottomless mimosas, uh, and that China somehow does this in command and control. But in one of the most, one of the most fiscally decentralized countries in the world, it's highly unlikely that that's the only way that they're doing this. So being able to put this in comparative perspective is a real treat, and that's what I hope that we do today and in our general conversation. So by way of introduction, the three people that we have here today, one, in two, one online and two in person. Jason Jackson is Ford Career Development Assistant Professor of Political Economy at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at the Massachusetts uh, Institute of, of Technology. Uh, his, relationship focuses, his research focuses on the relationship between states and markets. You need a better opening line. Yeah, I know. You need a better I'm opening line on that one. I'll go, I'll go with this one. Jason's work is particularly focused on the role of economic ideas and moral beliefs in shaping market institutions. 100% with you, right? Okay, online we have Daniel Traficante. Daniel is uh, Associate Professor of Law at Syracuse University College of Law and affiliate of the SU's Autonomous Systems Policy Institute. That sounds deeply DARPA and scary. We'll need to talk to him about that some, at some point. He is previously a teaching fellow in law and political economy at Sciences Po in Paris and completed his PhD in political economy at MIT. I'm sniffing an MIT connection here. J.S. Tan is, wait for it, a PhD candidate at MIT studying the political economy of the tech industry in the U.S. and China. He's a former tech worker and member of Collective Action in Tech, a group which aims to advance the tech labor movement. So, I leave it to you to tell us all about China and the United States and industrial policy comparatively. Please take it away. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for that generous introduction and also the help on uh, marketing, which is like a big, <laughs> a struggle with one how one presents himself on a website. Um, so I'm really excited to be here um, to share this work, uh, which I'm doing collectively um, with Dan Traficante, as Mark said, and J.S. Tan, um, who's um, here with us and also um, online. Um, so this is very um, kind of early stage work um, that comes out of conversations that Dan JS and myself have been having over the course of the last several months. Um, and it's motivated to a large degree, you know, precisely in the ways that sort of Mark put on the table that, you know, we're in this moment when there is an explicit return to um, discussion of industrial policy in the United States. Um, of course, uh, conversations around industrial policy um, have long been a part of the economic policy, the global economic policy discourse going back for decades. Um, and there's been much less variation in other countries, whether it be in, in other countries or regions, whether it be in Europe, um, certainly um, across much of Northeast and Southeast Asia over the course of the last um, several decades. Um, but in the U.S., industrial policy oftentimes is a bit taboo, at least in terms of policy and political um, discourse. Um, and so we see rises and falls um, in the extent to which industrial policy is sort of openly discussed um, in the American context. Um, so this current moment that we're in, um, shaped on one hand by, again, this rise of industrial policy discourse in the U.S., um, growing discussion, uh, more explicit discussion about competition um, with China, um, perhaps as a motivation um, for this return to industrial policy, um, has led us to sort of try to dive into understanding what's happening um, on the U.S. side, especially, which is most of what we'll talk about today uh, in terms of um, these discussions around industrial policy, um, and also to what extent are they driven by, uh, motivated by um, this sort of discourse around competition with China, um, and what are we seeing in China as well. And um, we'll say a bit about the latter, 
um, using the slides, but more about it um, uh, in the discussion afterwards in terms of how we think about industrial policy um, in China um, and very much picking up on um, sort of Mark's intro um, that the sort of the, the discourse that we often hear in, in American policy circles um, of a kind of authoritarian, fully top-down, um, really belies um, much more um, nuanced, um, much more political um, in terms of like pull, um, sort of tugs uh, uh, both within the CCP um, and across different regions, uh, provinces, and cities um, in China um, as well as in different industries. Um, but we'll probably say most about that, um, I think, in the, the Q&A. Um, and focus a little bit more um, in our presentation um, on some of these transformations that we're seeing, especially from the, the American side. But we look forward to discussing um, more on um, uh, sort of the, the sort of content um, of industrial policy, both in the U.S. and China, um, in the discussion. Okay, um, so the way that we're going to proceed is that I am going to um, uh, start the presentation, then I'll turn over to Dan, um, who'll take us through uh, much of the middle, and then um, I'll wrap up, and then we'll open up for conversation. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, much of this work is driven by this question of why we're seeing a return to industrial policy um, in the U.S. Um, on one hand, there's this discussion around competition with China, um, as we've noted, um, uh, but also there are other drivers as well, right? So certainly we see we have seen um, a growing discourse around um, the hollowing out of U.S. manufacturing, um, both from a kind of economic perspective um, in thinking about the impacts on jobs, especially in particular regions. Um, of the U.S., you can think about the Upper Midwest, the Rust Belt, um, classically, um, but in other parts of uh, the United States as well, um, as well as how these have translated into political dynamics over the course of the last 10 years with the rise of ethno-nationalism um, uh, and so forth. Um, but we also see other drivers uh, as well. And so one of the things that's prompted us is to sort of say, you know, what are the underlying factors um, that uh, are, are driving this, uh, these new discourses um, as well as new policy measures um, um, and legislative uh, measures um, around industrial policy. Before we get into that, let's just take a moment to sort of step back um, and just ask the question of, when we talk about industrial policy, what do we actually mean? So what are we referring to? Um, and so there are a number of ways to think about that. I mean, certainly we can think about classic cases um, of the developmental state um, uh, when we think about industrial policy. Um, so these would be um, primarily Japan, um, but also very crucially um, Korea and Taiwan. Um, and so the, the, the sort of the rise of industrial policy or the industrial policy in the context of the developmental um, states um, are really a feature of the post-war period, um, largely, um, uh, especially in Japan, um, led by um, key agencies um, like MITI, the Ministry of um, Industry um, and Trade, um, as well as uh, in Korea and uh, in Taiwan. Um, and these um, this industrial policy in this period sparked a number of really important debates, which are useful for us to think about um, in the context of industrial policy in the U.S., but probably especially um, in the context of the rise of industrial policy in China um, in the period from the 1980s onwards. Um, so there are debates between, well, what's, how does industrial policy function? Um, can we think about these two distinctions between what are thought about as sort of planned ideological state socialism on one hand versus sort of market rational um, modes of economic um, planning and, and organization? Um, uh, as well as what were some of the key analytic dimensions um, of industrial policy? Uh, so industrial policy uh, on one hand um, could be thought about in its technocratic dimensions, right? So how do you design particular kinds of policies to support certain industries to achieve particular uh, outcomes? Um, but this really misses the most interesting parts of industrial policy, I would suggest, um, which are really about politics, power, uh, and the kinds of institutional arrangements that we see um, in different um, state society sort of complexes, right? So how does power actually work in different places? Um, how, uh, do different, how do institutional arrangements in different country contexts um, shape the ways in which resources um, are, are directed uh, towards particular industries um, uh, and seek to achieve particular kinds of policy outcomes? Um, so this would really lead us to thinking about key things. So what are the kind of instruments, um, the policy instruments that are used um, in the execution of industrial policy? Um, what kinds of patterns of industrial organization do we see in different places? And by that I mean what kinds of arrangements of firms and industries uh, do we see? Do we see like mono single monopolistic firms in particular industries, for example? Um, or do we see industries that are promoted through lots of competition through smaller or medium-sized firms? Um, do we see um, arrangements that allow for 
deep interlinkages between large firms in different sectors, um, or those that try to put up barricades between those. We can think about um, antitrust or anti-monopoly policy, competition policy, um, for example, uh, in this respect. Um, do we see policies that support in different ways um, the development of intellectual property rights or protection of intellectual property rights? Um, or relax uh, intellectual property so as to allow firms to be able to take advantage um, of knowledge that's developed um, by others. So these are some of the kinds of underlying instruments um, that constitute industrial policy that also speak to the different arrangements and relationships um, between firms that ultimately are the entities that are producing the goods and services um, that drive um, economies. Um, so within all this, we can think both historically um, about uh, cases um, like Japan and Korea, um, and the role of different kinds of arrangements. So, for example, we could think about uh, the importance of business government councils. Um, so, again, these are kind of institutional arrangements that facilitate engagement between governments um, and business, um, where, you know, one sort of simple way to think about this is that it provides forums for businesses to sort of say, uh, identify and um, communicate the things that they need, the kinds of support they need, whether it be financial support, um, support with trade arrangements, support with competition against foreign firms, for example, um, or otherwise. Um, and governments uh, can work with uh, business entities to figure out the kinds of policy arrangements that would allow um, for that kind of support. Um, but also, crucially, um, in the developmental state uh, context, can also figure out ways to monitor um, the provision, the sort of outcomes um, of the provision of any kind of policy support or policy um, protections. So just very briefly, I'm just use Japan and Korea um, as sort of two prototypical examples. Um, and the point here is both to kind of I'd sort of lay out some of the, the sort of, again, the things that sort of underlie uh, industrial policy uh, on one hand, but also very crucially to make the point um, that China uh, from the 1980s onwards, um, just uh, as Korea and Taiwan did um, before, very much paid attention to and learned from Japanese and then ultimately Korean uh, and Taiwanese experience um, in designing and executing industrial policy as a means of developing um, their economies and making them uh, sort of uh, increasing uh, their levels of global competitiveness. So um, sort of learning uh, across countries, um, especially um, in the Northeast uh, Asia region, is very, very important. So very quickly, in Japan, what kind of things do we see? Um, wartime policies, for example, around things like foreign exchange controls, um, controls on technology imports um, as a means of targeting particular uh, industries, um, provision of, you know, you might think of pretty vanilla kinds of um, uh, economic policies like tax breaks, um, but also various kinds of targeted protections um, against um, foreign uh, competition. Um, and one of the key goals of these kinds of policies in Japan and later on in Korea, so the use of different kinds of targets um, and orchestrated incentives, were to lower the costs of particular inputs um, for firms in order to enable them to increase their capabilities um, and become more competitive. Um, there's a lot of really um, important work that um, is sort of classic in this realm. So Chalmers Johnson's work, for example, um, on Japan, or we could think of Alice Amson's work um, and Hajun Chang's work uh, on South Korea uh, in thinking about the role of, again, pricing. So sort of um, Amson's sort of dictum of famously um, ways in which policies were designed to get the prices wrong, um, very much against um, a kind of market-led uh, view of economic development. Um, as well as the development of reciprocal control mechanisms, right? This sort of idea that um, a crucial part of a successful industrial policy would see governments being able to monitor um, and discipline firms, uh, so uh, sort of reward them in cases where they are taking advantage of policies um, that are designed to enhance their capabilities, um, but also punishing them in cases um, where they don't. Um, so removing subsidies um, and uh, forcing them to face a greater uh, competition. Um, and again, this is a kind of crucial point because um, one of the sort of taglines um, with industrial policy is the idea of picking winners, which is only partially, which can be a bit misleading because it can suggest um, that firms um, get a sort of carte blanche um, from governments um, in cases where industrial policy is being pursued to sort of do what they want. Um, whereas one of the key insights from much of this literature was to show that this um, the role of um, various forms of, of disciplining um, as a counter to that uh, idea of just simply um, picking um, winners. Okay, so at this point I'm going to turn over to Dan, um, who will um, take us through a discussion of how we might think about industrial policy in the American context, um, given this backdrop that we've just um, had. Dan, over to you. Great, so um, where does the U.S. come in? So we propose 
And one way to think about this is to distinguish between two variants of American-style industrial policy. On the one hand, uh, what we might call the broader Hamiltonian tradition, going back to Alexander Hamilton's report on manufacturers in uh, the late 1700s. This is sort of the broad tradition of government-led economic development, led uh, for most of our history by the federal government. Uh, this would include things like the building of key infrastructure, including the railway system in the 19th century, selected tariffs, which sort of came and went uh, in, a, in a sort of cyclical fashion over, over the course of, uh, of our history. Government procurement, so what we have in mind here is, is things like the military-industrial complex, uh, direct purchases by uh, the U.S. military, uh, and so forth. So that's sort of the, this broader tradition. The um, specific variant that we are most interested in uh, and really what seems to be the focus of this revival of industrial policy that we've seen in the last few years uh, is the post-war tradition of government support for technology, uh, and specific, more specifically the, the R&D system, uh, which we'll talk about in further detail. This is also, uh, so some people would call this industrial policy. We think that's a, a plausible way uh, to describe it and a useful way. Others call this innovation policy. Certainly it's a, it's a variant uh, of innovation policy or simply technology policy. So again, what kind of things uh, does this include? R&D funding, primarily through the um, federal research agencies. Patent policy, so uh, including patent law, but also um, our uh, policies for the um, who gets to own the patent rights that come out of the federal research system. And then the education system more broadly. So um, what are the things that the, the government does to support STEM education, STEM training, uh, and research. Unfortunately, I don't have control over the slide. Yeah, there we go. So how do we how do we visualize this? Uh, on the whole, the system is something of a mosaic of different uh, research-oriented uh, agencies uh, spread out across the, the executive branch. So at the top here, we can see some of the flagship research agencies that you're probably familiar with, National Science Foundation, DARPA, which uh, it didn't fund my research at MIT, which was not uh, as uh, military technology focused, but certainly funds a lot of what happens uh, at MIT. NASA uh, and the NIH focused uh, on, on pharmaceuticals. And then the, the two rows below are these more targeted uh, technology specific research programs that have propped up really in the last 30 or 40 years or so. So these are newer efforts at identifying a particular technological area. So for example, ARPA-E is the uh, green energy equivalent uh, or sustainable technology equivalent of DARPA. Semitech was an effort in the late 1980s to uh, boost the uh, US semiconductor industry. Uh, SBIR is, is one effort to support um, small innovative companies. And Manufacturing USA, um, uh, to the right uh, on that second row there, is a, is a much more recent manufacturing specific program. So sort of get the sense that there's a, sort of these general flagship agencies at the top uh, and these more technology focused agencies at the, at the bottom here. Next slide. And by any measure, uh, this system has been enormously successful, right? So we can point to um, several areas in which uh, these key investments coming through this research system have developed transformative technologies that have been uh, important for particular technological capacities, but also have been the basis for entire new industries. So medicine, for example, there have been countless drugs and, and biomedical technologies generated by the NSF, NIH, uh, the MRI machine on the bottom left there. Uh, technology is important for national security, so stealth technology is, is one uh, key innovation that comes out of DARPA. Uh, the satellite system really the entire infrastructural basis for the ICT, the information and communication technology sector. And then even uh, on the bottom, bottom right there, that's um, Sergey and Larry, uh, who uh, founded Google with the help of an NSF grant in the 1990s, which was called the Digital Libraries uh, Initiative. So we even see the hand of the state in some of the success stories of the uh, Silicon Valley giants. Next slide. This is an image uh, some of you may be familiar with. This comes from Mariana Mazzucato's work. Um, and uh, she showed that if you take the iPhone, uh, and indeed many of the 
most popular consumer technologies that we use today. You can split up the, these technologies into their various components, and what you can do is you can actually trace back these components to a key investment or, or one or more key investments from generations earlier um, that come out of this system. So in the case of the iPhone, uh, most of these investments came out of the military-oriented uh, research agencies, including DARPA, DOD, and, and others. Now one, um, this sort of gets into some of the comparative element that we're interested in. So one key feature, one distinguishing feature that we think separates um, this variant of uh, American style industrial policy from some of the variants we see in the uh, comparative literature. So the, the cases that Jason was talking about, including the, the high development period in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, the American version looks um, much less centralized, it looks much more fragmented. Essentially, one way of thinking about this is this is industrial policy without planning. So as I showed in that sort of mosaic image of the various research agencies, uh, these are indeed uh, separate research agencies, right, with their own mandates, their own sources of funding, their own uh, internal squibbles about uh, what kind of things do we want to be supporting. Uh, there is no real central agency or uh, uh, point of command that uh, directs what these agencies as a whole are, are oriented toward. So uh, this is a largely decentralized and we can think weakly coordinated version of uh, technology development and technology planning. Now some people think that's a strength, which uh, certainly there, there's a strong case for um, some advantages to be had in, in certain redundancies uh, between agencies. So if, more than one team or indeed more than one agency is trying to solve the same problem in different ways. That can be advantageous. Uh, potentially this more decentralized system can move faster than um, a more centralized uh, counterpart. Uh, but there's also been commentary that this might be a weakness and that it might be one reason why um, the U.S. struggles uh, to, for example, move as fast as China, for example, when they set a new goal that, uh, you know, for example, China wants to specialize in a certain technology by 2025. Is the U.S. capable of doing that kind of thing? That's one of the questions that emerges from this more um, decentralized and weakly coordinated structure. Now, how do we understand this from a political economy uh, perspective? So we're, in our work in this project, we're drawing from a number of traditions and in some sense, we're trying to dis distinguish uh, our project from these, these other traditions. So um, the first of these is, the, is uh, what's called the Neil Polanyan uh, perspective. And I don't know if Andrew Schrank is in the audience, but um, we're here. drawing on... <laughs> he is here, okay. We're drawing on some of his work, as well as Fred Block uh, and uh, Matthew Keller uh, work. This uh, framework, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, but this... Um, uh, frames uh, much of this system, the, the R&D system, as a counter response or a counterweight to market forces that uh, threaten to destabilize and, and fragment things like innovation networks um, and the capacity of the economy as a whole to, uh, to generate innovation. So in other words, the R&D system is, is the counter movement that is preserving uh, this kind of capacity. Uh, another perspective is the military exceptionalist uh, framework set up by uh, Linda Weiss in her book, America, Inc. This is a slightly different framework in that it posits that um, really most of this can just be explained as the US, as the military, right? And that any uh, incidental benefits that come out of R&D expenditures is, is exactly that. It's incidental or secondary. Um, so in other words, this is the idea that the U.S. military is really um, self-expanding. It's its own thing. Uh, it's not, it's relatively insulated from outside pressures, things like market pressures, uh, pressures uh, from the business class, and so forth. The uh, state structuralist perspective, um, in contrast, explains this uh, decentralized system as basically a reflection of the decentralized nature of the American state. So, of course, uh, we do have a very large and to some degree fragmented uh, system. Uh, it's a federalized system. The federal government itself is, is massive in many areas of regulation. It's weakly coordinated, and so the R&D system is uh, uh, alleged to fit in, into this broader structure. And finally, the business state nexus. This is a way of looking at um, this variant of industrial policy uh, 
as a result of uh, essentially pressure from the business class, or at least an inner an exchange or a relationship between the business class. We might say the research intensive segment of the business class uh, and the federal government. This indeed, there have been a lot of um, work uh, using this framework on other uh, on those classic uh, examples of industrial policy in other countries that, that Jason mentioned. There hasn't been a lot of work on this in the U.S. So what we want to do, one of the things we want to do in this project is to bring in um, what we think is, a, is a, an alternative framework uh, that draws on the international dimension. So it aims to bring in pressures arising, arising out of global competition, both military competition and pure economic rivalry, and perhaps more specifically technological uh, rivalry. So what we propose is uh, looking at this uh, R&D intensive variant of industrial policy as a product of international competition. Uh, and in particular, international competition between tw three uh, global rivals over uh, three separate periods. So we'll talk about what those periods are, but those three rivals are the USSR uh, in the late 50s and 1960s, Japan in the late 70s and early 1980s, and then finally today with China. We think this is useful, first of all, as an explanation for, um, or as a framework for explaining uh, why the U.S. does industrial policy in the way that it does, why do we have certain agencies, why did these develop when they develop? And then also uh, as a potential uh, lens for explaining the current dynamic with China and perhaps even in predicting uh, in what ways U.S. industrial policy will conform or change in response to the Chinese competitive threat. So again, so what are these, what are these three periods? Yeah, that's okay. I kind of went through that. So uh, a little bit about this first period. So this is the, the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, the U.S., uh, of course, had been funding research um, in a fairly intensive way following World War II, but things changed fairly dramatically after 1958 when the USSR launched uh, the Sputnik satellite. So almost immediately, the U.S. government uh, massively increased federal R&D funding. Uh, this was understood in military terms, right? Of course, the the showing from the USSR that they had this uh, capacity to to uh, develop uh, space age uh, technologies was, of course, seen as connected to um, a military threat. It was also seen immediately in light of the um, concerns over the economic competition with the USSR and, and perhaps the ideological, the sort of broader ideological competition between our communist, uh, high tech communist rival. Uh, in the U.S., so this was uh, this was following Khrushchev's famous intention that the USSR would bury the West. Uh, mostly, what he had in mind was we, we would bury the West economically. So, um, in the immediate aftermath, after 1958, we saw the creation of new flagship R&D agencies that still exist today and, and still, indeed, still dominate the uh, federal research system. These included uh, DARPA, which was then called ARPA, uh, and NASA. There was some, <coughs> excuse, excuse me. There was some policy interest in this period, in what we can call institutional mimicry. So um, there was some sense uh, and some interest in some of the more planning-friendly um, senators and uh, policymakers at this time, and basically looking at what the USSR was doing and saying, uh, should we try to copy um, some of what they're doing? In particular, there was some interest in in reforming the kind of decentralized and more fragmented system that I talked about, and reforming that and shifting it toward a more centralized alternative. So famously, uh, there were proposals for the creation of a centralized Department of Science and Technology that would um, uh, compile and control, or combine and control all of those uh, key research agencies into one uh, department with a cabinet seat, um, with, with a, a secretary of science and technology having real power to command uh, the, the research agenda. This was seen as, uh, as a possible response. Ultimately, it wasn't pursued uh, for a number of reasons. The, the existing agencies were thought to be sufficient. During this time, though, there was a major focus, again, on military research, even though there was this sort of underlying economic nationalist uh, competition. Uh, much of this took place in the, in the framework of the Cold War. And we suggest uh, a, a reading of this period uh, that is plausible is that this focus on 
military oriented research and this military competition ultimately underlined um, uh, sorry undermined this form of uh, industrial policy during this period so in particular the fact that uh, R&D research had been uh, so associated with with the military and with military competition this led to problems leading into the Vietnam War uh, in which uh, DARPA was was very active it helped develop uh, Agent Orange and so there was a, a, a very significant popular um, backlash against this kind of funding and this form of uh, industrial policy in general during this period and led to cutbacks ultimately in the 1970s. <clears throat> I think we're, I think you might have skipped, yeah. A little bit about this uh, second period. So now we're into the, uh, really starting in the late 1970s, around 1977, 78, uh, the latter half of the Carter administration, and then into the Reagan revolution uh, into the 1980s. So what was the what was the equivalent competitive threat, international threat during this period? It was Japan, which of course didn't pose a military threat, but there were, uh, uh, during this period in the U.S., uh, importantly, this was uh, a period of uh, economic stagnation and economic crisis. This was a period of uh, industrial or perhaps post-industrial decline in regions throughout the United States, which we're still dealing with today. And uh, what we saw was rising economic anxieties following Japan's uh, dramatic rise, uh, following its high development decades in the 1950s and then into the late 1970s. Uh, the view was at this time that Japan was so far advanced compared to the U.S. technologically that it was using these sort of advanced technologies, that uh, its industrial economy was more automated. Again, during this period, there was a lot of interest in institutional mimicry, and in particular, uh, Jason mentioned the the MIDI, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, which was the sort of the commanding um, industrial policy agency in Japan during this period. Uh, there were actually proposals for a, a DITI, so a Department of International Trade and Industry, so exactly the same kind of uh, potential mimicry that we saw in the 1960s. Uh, indeed, there were um, uh, there were uh, site visits, there were there were uh, international um, research visit, visits coordinated by the Carter administration. So Carter sent uh, economic advisors over to Japan to try to take notes on what exactly had, uh, Japan had been doing. Uh, uh, but however, a renewed interest in uh, technology policy and indeed in replicating the sort of industrial policy ran into uh, the figure on the bottom right of the slide here. So um, the neoliberal shift made uh, anything that was remotely associated with planning uh, a cardinal sin and indeed industrial policy as a term became something of a taboo during this period which is part of why its uh, dramatic revival in the last three, three years or so is so striking still though uh, we did see reforms during this period so the renewed interest in technology policy uh, resulted in a new focus on the university business government nexus uh, so we passed something called the Bayh-Dole Act, which uh, endorsed private ownership of uh, the um, the IP that comes out of uh, this system, and it sort of was an effort to um, to uh, jumpstart the uh, the university government uh, system. And then, the, uh, additionally, the creation of some of those uh, more technology-specific agencies that I mentioned at the beginning. So the SBIR, Semitech, and the MEP program, which is a manufacturing-oriented uh, program that still exists today. So um, the point here is that we've we've been through this before in two, these two different periods. Now each period is is quite different, but we believe that there are themes, cross-cutting themes, running through uh, the first two two periods that inform uh, and help frame where we are today. So who is the international uh, competitor today? Well, it's quite obvious. Uh, it's China. Uh, other, other motivations are also worth mentioning. So uh, this revival of industrial policy that we've seen in the last few years, far and away we think uh, mostly it has to do with uh, Chinese competition and anxieties about both uh, Chinese economic capacities, technological capacities, and potentially uh, China as a military rival. In the middle here though, um, we also see some motivation for uh, a new emphasis on R&D policy and industrial policy coming out of concerns over secular stagnation. And then finally, uh, this comes mostly from the sort of the progressive left, uh, 
the idea that the R&D system can be reworked and retooled to help address uh, the climate crisis. <clears throat> and for, uh, for each of these three proposals or these three motivations, we see uh, relatively prominent uh, policymakers and thinkers endorse this kind of vision. So uh, Schumer, for example, has been a leading voice trying to um, expand the, the federal research system. He put forward a, a proposal called the Endless Frontier Act, which some, uh, a major part of which ended up in the uh, Chips and Science Act passed last year. Uh, in the middle, there, these are economists, uh, Johnson and Gruber from MIT, who wrote a book called Jumpstarting America. This is the idea that uh, we should turn to the R&D system as a way out of this uh, low growth uh, cycle that we seem to be in. And then the, the climate-oriented version of industrial policy seems to be fitting with, in keeping with the Green New Deal proposed by Ocasio-Cortez and, and others on the, on the progressive side. And so already we've seen the U.S. Uh, um, begin to uh, take action. So it sounds like this uh, group has, has discussed this in the last few weeks, but uh, last August, we saw the, uh, the uh, enactment of the Chips and Science Act. This included $200 billion over 10 years for R&D commercialization programs, so a fairly substantial expansion of the system that, that I've been discussing. Uh, $52 billion for semiconductor uh, manufacturing facilities in particular, clearly done in a, in a response to concerns over um, over-reliance on Taiwan and perhaps uh, anxieties about the Taiwan-China relationship and then $24 billion in tax credits for chip production. So uh, additionally, this, this response is clearly going to have major impacts for regional development across the country. So uh, this, was, uh, this was the news of the year uh, where I work in, uh, in central New York and Syracuse. So uh, this was a, a pledge from the company Micron of uh, $100 billion in investment. Yes, you heard that correctly, $100 billion over about 10 years or so, a promise to employ uh, thousands of, um, uh, of people, uh, not just uh, for people with PhDs, but indeed thousands of jobs for technicians, uh, supposedly well-paying jobs. So we, we see in this response the, the promise to maybe remake or reverse some of the post-industrial decline at least in sort of some in, in some of these regions that have been uh, picked out for these investments. Those are, are what we might call constructive measures. We've also seen what we can call defensive measures, so measures that involve uh, putting up uh, borders, uh, putting up walls metaphorically. So uh, we, as we know, as, as you probably know, there's an emerging uh, chip war. Uh, just a few months ago, the U.S. enacted export controls. Um, uh, banning American chip companies from supplying Chinese chip makers with certain technologies. Uh, these included restrictions on any foreign firms uh, reliant on U.S. tech that also want to do business with Chinese chip makers, and then even a ban on American citizens and, and green card holders from working with Chinese chip firms. So a clear, um, uh, indeed quite aggressive response to the uh, emerging rivalry, at least with respect to chips. We've also seen increased anxieties and, and suspicions of um, uh, Chinese and Chinese American academics. Uh, and indeed, we've, there was a high profile arrest a few years ago. This was coming out of the uh, DOJ's China initiative, which was started under Trump. Uh, this was an arrest of um, Gong Chen, who's a, a, quite a prominent nanotechnology scholar at MIT. Fortunately for Professor Chen, the charges were dropped two years later, but um, the idea, was, the idea was that he didn't report certain uh, links that he had had with uh, sources of, of, of Chinese funding and certain Chinese research groups. So clearly, <clears throat> increased suspicion by the federal government of um, the exchange of information uh, between China and the U.S. All right, super. Thanks, Dan. Um, so let's jump back in. Um, just to say, so if we look across um, this, this kind of idea of these changes across these periods, um, we can think about what some of the drivers of these changes are. So just to kind of summarize what we said, so is it a rise, can we think about this in terms of a, a kind of new, you know, sort of biodynamics, um, where we see particular kinds of shifts um, in conceptions of public investment. Um, again, a lot of this, again, is driven by sort of ideas of what's happening, um, of the way in which China is doing industrial policy, about which I'll say more in just a moment. Um, 
But you also see, obviously, real legislative change, as we've been dis discussing um, through the passage of like the infrastructure bills um, and so forth. Um, and also, more broadly, this sort of idea that the United States needs to reindustrialize um, after decades of deindustrialization, whether it be because of these domestic drivers in terms of like jobs um, and the kind of political backlash that we've seen um, or that people interpret um, uh, the U.S. to be um, experiencing um, in regions that have experienced uh, deindustrialization, um, as well as global competition um, uh, as well. So stagnant productivity growth are drivers, um, supply chain fragility, um, especially um, as highlighted um, during um, the lockdowns um, over the course of the last couple of years of the pandemic, um, rising inequality, um, the climate crisis uh, more generally. Um, but then, you know, much of this allows us to kind of take a step back and, and sort of ask this question. So both the historical view that we presented, um, as well as some of these um, kind of contemporary drivers. Um, and the question is, you know, to what extent was the U.S. ever really laissez-faire? So should we rethink um, the extent to which um, their, the sort of anti-industrial policy rhetoric that we've um, heard and seen at particular times in the U.S. Um, in our threefold um, temporal typology, for example, uh, during the period of the 1970s and the 1980s, um, whether it was uh, really reflecting the reality of the way in which um, the U.S. does industrial policy, or whether it reflected a kind of, um, or it obscured um, what was a sort of developmental state in disguise, um, to borrow um, from Robert Wade's term, but then also, again, to build on uh, some of the work that others have done, like Fred Block um, and Andrew um, as well. Um, so in this period, it's, in this moment, it's also worth, again, thinking about, well, what is this sort of idea of industrial policy um, in China um, that is driving much of um, this response um, in the U.S.? Um, so earlier I described, I sort of gave some, offered some ways of thinking about industrial policy uh, generally um, and used the examples um, of Japan and Korea as a sort of prototypical um, cases of the developmental state. Um, and noted that certainly China has paid close attention um, to the sort of success, success of those countries um, and their experiences. However, China is not Japan or, or North Korea. Um, so that's not at all to suggest um, that the industrial policy path that China has charted is one that seeks to directly mimic or replicate um, either Japanese um, or Korean experience. Um, and this is for a variety of reasons, right? So on one hand, Japan didn't have the same sort of state capacity, sorry, China didn't have the same kind of state capacity um, as did, let's say, Japan or Korea in 1978 um, when Deng Xiaoping um, began uh, the transformations that have led to the sort of industrial modernization in China over the course of the last um, four decades. Um, also, the nature of industrial targeting, the kinds of industrial targeting that I described earlier were different. Um, so, for example, and this is drawing from people like Barry Naughton's uh, work, for instance, um, uh, in Japan and Korea, industrial policy was very much designed um, for catch-up. Um, and so you see focus on industries like automobiles and electronics. So think about like the, the major Japanese firms um, and parks that we uh, consider today are very much were in these um, arenas. Uh, whereas in China, um, especially in recent years, in the last 10 to 15 years, it's been much more about leapfrogging. Um, so you see uh, heavy investments um, in much more frontier industries, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, um, quantum computing, um, and so forth. Um, and so this is a kind of key, another sort of important um, distinction. Um, we mentioned in the very beginning, and Mark actually signaled this as well, that China is large and diverse. Um, uh, both um, economically, politically, institutionally. And so the, uh, the capacity to um, do the kind of more top-down style industrial policy that we see in Japan and especially in Korea uh, was really not um, uh, possible politically and, or administratively um, in China, and certainly empirically is not what we see. Instead, we see industrial policy occurring much more through the provision of resources in a much more decentralized fashion, um, oftentimes through competition between different provinces um, and cities, and really tied to political competition within the CCP as well. So the ability um, to demonstrate and the capacity to generate growth in a particular city or province um, oftentimes is the means by which um, party officials um, can themselves rise within um, the overall um, higher, uh, political um, hierarchy. Um, so the political structure um, in this respect and administrative structure are quite um, different. Um, and then finally, just to make a note about the relationship, of course, between business and the state, again, a central component um, of industrial um, policy, um, which again, we talked about earlier using the Japanese and Korean uh, sort of examples. Um, certainly in, in China, um, what we see certainly right now is a really quite fraught relationship um, between um, 
the Chinese state and certainly uh, a number of leading very high profile companies um, and, and managers, capitalists, um, sort of um, owners of these companies um, where we see sort of arrests, different kinds of pressures being um, put um, on, on individuals. Um, and so this particular kind of targeting um, raises key questions for us. <clears throat> which are part of some of the underlying uh, motivations um, for the project. So what is behind, uh, how do we think about the, the sort of logics um, behind targeting uh, some of these um, figures? Is it about the transformation of the Chinese uh, development model, and perhaps from one that's focused a lot on software and platforms towards hardware, um, which would certainly tie in to the sort of reactions in the US if we think about uh, this focus on semiconductors um, and chips, um, for example. Um, so just in conclusion, um, just again to, to kind of stick, take a step back and, and think across these three periods, um, bearing in mind um, both the kinds of developments that we're seeing in the U.S. Um, around industrial policy uh, on one hand, um, as well as the sort of nature um, and sort of, uh, sort of instruments um, of industrial policy um, in its sort of historic competitors, the Soviet Union and Japan um, in the two earlier periods, um, as well as what we see in China now um, uh, as well. Um, and this kind of framing, I think, allows us to do at least two things. Um, one is to think about, um, again, this question of the, the underlying drivers, um, but also to think about the extent to which um, what we see at work is an outcome of, um, of sort of military competition, um, which certainly was key in the first period with the Soviet Union, even though, um, as the Khrushchev quote um, sort of uh, 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 notes, um, a lot of it was about economic competition as well, and it's, it's easy to forget that in the 1950s, the broad question of whether capitalism or communism was a superior economic system was very much an open question. Um, and so what was at stake really um, was also um, which sort of a broad uh, economic system uh, was more productive in terms of generating growth and social transformation and uh, uh, higher levels of human welfare. Um, also, secondly, we think about this question of economic nationalism um, and how is economic nationalism actually operating um, across these three periods? Um, to what extent can we think about economic nationalism um, as the underlying motivation um, of these, these kinds of industrial policy um, packages that we see certainly in the U.S. over time, but then also in some of the countries that we've discussed in the, the kind of prototypical developmental states, um, but then also, of course, in China as well. Um, so a kind of key question, uh, so these are some key questions for us um, as we continue uh, with this work. Um, so think about this question of national security on one hand um, versus economic nationalism, or are the two fundamentally intertwined? So to what extent can we disentangle uh, the two? Um, and also this question of economic nationalism, um, and really sort of looking under the hood, so to speak, uh, of economic nationalism to think about well, what is the underlying content and ideas that animate uh, different types of nationalist um, ideas um, and ways in which they actually translate um, into, in our case, industrial policy um, outcomes. Um, so we'll stop there um, and look forward to uh, the conversation. Thank you very much. As ever, we have microphones. We have people online. Hello, people online. Uh, I'm going to open up with a question from online just to get us started which is the following. Question for the presenters. Are attitudes towards US industrial policy a bipartisan project, or are there significant differences between the Republicans and Democrats in their approaches? Um, so one of the things which is striking, and um, Dan and Jess probably have thoughts on, on this as well, um, is the extent, and many people I think point to this, is the extent to which we see bipartisanism, um, bipartisanship, um, it's hard to even name the term because we, so, we see so little of it today in the U.S. <laughs> I don't remember what the term is. Um, uh, it is, this does seem to be one of the areas where um, there's commonality in outlook um, in Washington across um, both parties. Um, and that's striking, I think, um, in this particular moment of uh, sort of political um, fracturing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, j just to add, there, there are certainly parts, I would say, of the, the Democratic left or the progressive left that, that do sort of come out strongly in sort of a non -na non-nationalist terms and sort of a very anti-war rhetoric, but I would say at this point still largely minority 
But, but there's also the fact that if you look into what Republicans have been doing recently, check my Twitter feed, um, <laughs> you'll find that they're already saying you know, almost Medicare style, you know, with the expansion of Obamacare. We're not taking that, right? And now you've got, like, I think, 12 states that are saying we're not taking any of the IRA money. And they've made it quite clear, if you look at the debt ceiling negotiations, or to call it what it actually is, the hostage and blackmail of this year, uh, that uh, they really want to gut the IRA. This is sort of defending, if you will, the carbon business model of those states. How do you think about that? Because, I mean, what it suggests is there's far less coherence to a notion of a, of a state here as a state project. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll make one small comment on this, and um, JS and Dan, if you want to, to sort of jump in. So actually, we have a colleague um, uh, of ours um, at MIT, Phil Thompson, and one of the things that he points to in, um, is the extent to which the tension goes down another level. Um, so in many cities, in many of these states um, that are resisting um, the IRA, so because a disproportionate number of states now in the U.S. are Republican-led, as we've all been seeing over the course of the last uh, a couple of years with some of the legislation that's being passed. Um, but many of the cities are democratically-led. Um, and in fact, many of the cities, um, as uh, my colleague Phil would know too, are led by black mayors. Um, so it brings in both um, these sort of the, the, the sort of tensions we see at different levels of governance in the United States, and not just between the federal and the state, but also state down to municipalities, um, Secondly, across the political divides of Democrats in the White House, uh, obviously, um, right, many Republican-dominated um, legislatures with Democratic cities. And then finally, raising the question of, of race in a kind of interesting way, because it speaks at minimum um, to the question of how some of the benefits of, like, let's say, the IRA may actually translate on the ground into jobs, into provisions of, like, you know, um, housing retrofits um, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, and so we see this kind of tension, I think, manifesting in a, in a sort of really interesting way in, in this respect. JS and Dan want to jump in further. I, I think just to add to that, I think what is so striking about the pushback, because if, you know, there's always going to be pushback if one of the parties is in power, and in particular if the Democrats are in power. But I think um, what is so striking as we look back at the, in particular the 70s and 80s, is now the total absence of a pushback um, against this kind of these kind of interventions as planning. In other words, um, I think there's been pushback against uh, spending writ large and concerns over inflation and, and so forth. But uh, as, as far as I can tell, what we don't see is you know a ta is industrial policy still being this taboo, uh, which really was a problem even leading into the Obama administration. Obama struggled with um, some of his uh, administration's interventions in uh, in green technology. There was the, the, uh, the controversy over Solyndra. The pushback then was that, you know, pretty similar to what we saw in the 80s, that this was uh, picking winners, this was planning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and from what, I can, from what I can tell, we don't see that today, which is, you know, the at the very minimum, establish, establishes bipartisan agreement that, um, you know, maybe it is time to start picking winners or at least start picking sectors for some kind of support. Um, that's at least my reading of, of the situation. Yeah, I'll just jump in as advert one small thing as well. One of the things that's also striking um, in thinking about this historically, as we're trying to do, is um, th so uh, obviously we talk about the second period and competition, all this anxiety around competition with Japan. Then the end of the 80s happened, the early 90s, Japan goes into economic stagnation. But then also, of course, the Berlin Wall falls, um, the Cold War ends, and then it heralds a period both of sort of neoliberalism, as we've been discussing, but kind of more crucially, this kind of American triumphalism, this sort of idea that the American capitalist model has won. Um, we see strong growth throughout the 1990s and the 2000s, you know, at least up until the financial crisis. Um, and the sort of absence of what's seen as a sort of real, um, sort of at least economic um, competition um, uh, elsewhere in the world, including um, with the, the sort of EU or, or the EC, and certainly not China until the 2010s. Um, and so this kind of triumphalism um, may play an important role, I think, in the kind of um, the the context in which the Biden administration faced challenges in pushing the Green New Deal, as, as Dan was just saying. Yeah, I guess I want to, um, well, thank you. I, I enjoyed this enormously. Um, but I want to make a comment. I can't tell whether it's complimentary or pushing back. Um, but 
it's that I think what's new here is not the industrial policy, it's admitting it. And I don't think it's new just in the United States. I think it's true in all capitalist countries. And I guess this is the pushback. Um, Japan never admitted it either. I mean, if you read Johnson's book carefully, he's very explicit and spends a lot of time on these Japanese senior bureaucrats at MIDI saying, it's a marginal agency, it doesn't do anything, it's these American paranoids who think that this is running the show. We're a liberal market economy just like everybody else. Because who would want to acknowledge that they're engaging in a trade war? There's no incentive to do it, except in the United States today. What's changed? Uh, federal R&D outlays as a share of the, the budget, the federal budget, are now about less than one-third of what they were in the early 1960s. They dipped to about a quarter of what they were in the early 1960s just before COVID. They've trended upward to about 3% of the federal budget. They're nowhere near where they were at the height of the Cold War. And that's true as a share of GDP as well. Um, so, you know, the U.S. is doing less industrial policy today by far than it was doing at the height of the Cold War. What's different is Biden loves going out to ribbon-cutting ceremonies in Ohio to say, I'm going to bring the jobs back. I'm going to bring the jobs back. I'm going to bring the... And that's all all about electoral politics. And he loves saying, and by the way, they're electric cars, because then you could bring the liberals in Providence on board, right? And he loves saying, oh, and it's about China, because then you can bring the Cold War hawks on board. And it's, you know, I think it's largely about electoral politics. Uh, but in terms of the actual spending, it's nowhere near what it was at the height of the Cold War. Andrew, I had both said wrong. Mike, Mike. The Biden and economics guys were, you know, the bottomless, bottomless mimosas are mostly tax credits. So unless you calculate in the, and that could double the number. It's still nowhere close. It's, it's still nowhere close? It's nowhere you, close. Nowhere close. If you go as a share of GDP and not just federal outlays, it's even lower. I mean, it's really nowhere. I mean, yeah. even, 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 okay. But they are potentially bottomless. I mean, you could get up there, but that's a big if. That's a very big if. Yeah. Next up. Can I just, just quickly to respond yeah. to, to Andrew? So, I, so thanks, Andrew. I mean, I think, I think that's a good point. I think that's a very fair qualifier. But we're also um, potentially just at the beginning of this, uh, of this third period. Uh, so I think, I mean, I, I agree. It's very unlikely that we'll get back to something like 3.5 percent of the federal budget, uh, which is what we had in, in 63. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think these investments are significant. Um, and I think um, depending on the electoral changes in the next 48 years, I mean, we'll see where, where else we go with this with this uh, prompting by the anxiety with, with China. I don't disagree. I just think what's new is boasting about it and trying to get the right. elect getting the electoral winnings from it. Uh, this was great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I have a question that I'm grappling with right now, which is basically the role of money in industrial competition with the green transition currently. Um, because if you look at resources across countries, China actually kind of has them sewn up. They're producing over 40% of wind turbines, 70% of solar panels, the majority of the cars, and they also have a monopoly on the critical minerals we need to build these things, right? But the, the counter argument could be, well, the U.S. can just buy its way out of this still, right? Because we're the global reserve currency, we're extremely wealthy and powerful. Um, and so my question actually harks back to the eras you were talking about. Do you know the sort of comparative spending that was happening between these countries, say the U.S. and the Soviet Union and the U.S. and Japan and so on and today? I'm wondering how much money actually plays a role in these global competitions that we see. And then answer it. <laughs> yeah, that's a deep breath. Um, so I don't know off the. T I'm not sure if um, Dan or JS if we have an idea of what the spending number. So I would say certainly my feeling is um, in the first period, very similar uh, in terms of high levels of spending. Uh, that would be my guess um, uh, by the Soviet Union. Um, and sort of spending broadly defined as well. So um, especially maybe in, in areas like you kind of hinted at or you sort of noted with China in terms of like securing access to key minerals, for example, if we think about like battery um, uh, production, for instance. Um, 
certainly the Soviet Union and the United States were equally as active in similarly seeking to secure lines of supplies from, you know, then sort of like decolonizing mostly countries um, uh, in Asia and Africa and then also like in, in Latin America um, as well. Um, and huge amounts of spending in terms of like providing different kinds of sort of developments, you know, under the, co the guise um, or the, the, the sort of the institutional channel of development aid um, to many places, which again is kind of similar to what um, China has been doing um, in many places, especially in securing, again, like rare earth min access to rare earth minerals and so forth. So I, I don't know the numbers. I mean, I think that's it's a really good question and something that we should um, try to find out. And that would be, I think, useful um, uh, sort of evidence. Um, but certainly from sort of my reading of a lot of like archival materials in different areas around this, I would say very similar. Um, and very much in seeing themselves in competition in this respect. Um, in the second period of the Japan, I don't know. Um, there, my guess would be probably less. Um, also, the, 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 yeah, in the U.S., yeah. Um, partly because of the nature of the Japanese development model, um, is my sense, um, but also just the fiscal capacity um, of Japan, I think, was significantly less relative to the U.S., whereas probably more comparable um, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the 50s and 60s. Um, but that's these are just that's just my sense. Yeah. And yeah, I think in that second period there, um, the comparison would have to be more institutional. So, um, you know, J Japan is, or or had innovated with with regard to its um, its institutional arrangements to control the economy and, and direct it in a certain way. Whereas in the '60s, I mean, I think as Jason said, I mean, pretty much the U.S. and the U.S. are actually doing the same thing, right? They had these. Uh, elite uh, agencies, these elite teams of, of researchers, scientists, astronauts, etc. Um, you know, the, the NASA system was, is really a, a centralized plan economy within a, within a capitalist economy. But I think, I, I think the comparison in, in Japan might be, might be tougher to make, um, at least with respect to just pure outlays of funding. Just yeah. to build on that a little bit, um, if you are going to do this comparison across the three time periods, as well as money in different periods and then institutions in different periods, I will, of course, have to play the kind of the ideas card on this, right? Mm -hmm. So could you imagine if you had the current sort of like high-end finance, quasi-post-neoliberal state trying to do industrial policy, right? But the frameworks of the day transplanted back to the 50s, right? We would have tried to build the interstate highway system with blended finance, right? That's the big difference, right? Basically, a lot of what we do for capacity has been outsourced to the private sector. Yeah. And we assume, and this is the bottomless margaritas, right, that if we just bribe them, then there will be enough, you know, uh, investment forthcoming to do these sorts of things. So rather than sort of, you know, the state saying we need to build infrastructure or we do whatever, right, we basically try and incentivize various private actors to provide it for us. And then when you discover that their internal hurdle rates are like 40% and stuff like that, of course it doesn't happen. And then you end up with the whole project being hamstrung. And this is the critique of the de-risking state, etc. So I think it's something to really think about if you're going to do this sort of cross-temporal. That If you just imagine, right, you know, Eisenhower was now president. He's like, okay, we need to build this road. And we're like, right, well, what private contracts and public-private partnerships can we build? They'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about, right? But that's where we are in this moment. Um, second thing, just historically, if you're going to set this up, and we haven't spoken nearly enough about China, unfortunately, but um, the sort of China took a bunch of stuff from the developmental state, mm, yes and no. I wouldn't press that too closely. I mean, essentially, it was a comparative advantage in environmental despoilation and having a huge labor pool. With special economic zones, a complete lack of domestic savings, huge reliance on foreign direct investment, and being on the wrong end of the trade when it came to USAID. So you then have a huge reliance on state-owned enterprises, which Western economics never understood why they had these things and persisted with them, right? And because they were the other growth engine, basically when the exports shut down and the private sector got into trouble. So it's a very different model from, from the developmental state. I wouldn't try and make that comparison. I don't think you need it. And I think it's deeply problematic. Who else while we're here? Brad, you got anything? Tony, go again. It does seem, it would be interesting in, in looking at the, the inputs to the iPhone, how much of that is the result of more structured planned events uh, and 
and how much of it is the current kind of throwing money at a sector and what you're calling innovation policies uh, and, and how different is innovation policy in in reality from from uh, industrial policy and uh, are we in a new era and is everybody kidding themselves I mean because the part of the reason that it's bipartisan is that it looks like we're not picking winners and we're not doing that maybe we are we're just throwing money at sectors and hoping that something trickles out and have been lucky across a number of industries now, I think Tony's raising a really interesting point here that I haven't thought about, which is what DARPA does is design specific technologies. So if you think TCP IP to withstand electromagnetic blast, right? If you think touchscreen, which was originally Lodestar, which is I think was US Air Force rather than US Navy, but regardless, right? They were all like, can you make this thing? And then they made this thing. And then it lay around and Steve Jobs came along and picked them up and put them in the box and we all went, ooh, right? What we're doing now is very different. We're not designing things. We're literally just saying, how much can we subsidize your cost of capital, and then you can go do things. And that's a entirely different business model. I mean, really seen that way, I'm not even sure that's industrial policy. One thing we haven't talked about is the national labs. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about the, is the national labs, and that blurs these boundaries even more because they're government-owned and contractor-operated, right? I mean, I think these lines are way blurrier than just like there was some discrete jumping-off point where it went from public to private. Even the National Highway Tran the National the National Highway Transportation Act, or whatever the hell it's called, um, you know, yeah, Eisenhower contracts got, but he's contracted to private builders. It was private builders who were out there in North Dakota building the roads. It's not like it was the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers doing with soldiers. Right. Well, there was a sort of, basically, it, was a, it wasn't a no-bid brine contract that was a public-private partnership. It was, here's what we're paying, go do it. Yes, but public-private partnerships actually go back more than 100 years. Yeah, it's true. I mean, they, you know, it is interesting. This gets slippy, doesn't it? It gets very slippy. Yeah. I, mean, I think there's a huge opportunity here precisely because it gets slippy. And one thing I was thinking as you guys were talking, and I've already talked too much, is I think you know way too much of our this literature on the hidden developmental state in the U.S. that I've contributed to and that I hate <laughs> um, you know, is is built around a very distinct period when the U.S. is the unipolar yeah. hegemon, and it's like we have to convert the labs to do something else. So when I was in Sandia doing this research on the solar energy industry coming out of Sandia, I was like, what are we going to do with all these scientists and engineers in, in Sandia now that we're the only global power? But, you know, that was like a 20-year period. And up until 1990, the U.S. industrial policy was all... Not all, but largely military oriented, and now we're back to being largely, but not entirely military oriented. I, you know, I happen to think that the green stuff is a bigger part of it than you guys are letting on, and the job stuff is a bigger part of it than you're letting on. I've been involved in some of these discussions in D.C., and I hate to say it, it's kind of making a pluralist of me, um, uh, within boundaries, you know, <laughs> Miliband type boundaries. But you know, there's a there, you know, when I was in these the Biden conversations, the corporate sector wasn't there. Labor was there, and the environmentalists were there. Um, the corporate people weren't there. I think they weren't there because they didn't need to be there. Um, there were congressional staffers there putting boundaries around the conversation, saying, "Yeah, there's only so far we're going to go." Um, but you know, the environmentalists were at the table, and they were listened to, and and you know, labor was listened to. Anyway, I'll shut up now. I'm sorry. Anyone else? There you go, it's one now. So something I think the last couple questions we're getting at is the investment in basic research versus research directed towards a specific goal or project. Uh, so I know with CRISPR, for example, a lot of the individual scientific insights that ultimately led to CRISPR were serendipitous. So I'm wondering if there are any examples of basic research at the, obviously it, it happens at the university level, but um, in the private sector as well, and we used to have like Bell Labs, for example. Are there any modern examples of that? I suppose one uh, very contemporary example would be the the AI uh, news that we've we've seen lately. Um, I, I don't know the history of of that research so well. Obviously, computer science as a field is based on government intervention and government research from uh, decades ago, but I think perhaps the modern equivalent of, of Bell Labs is, um, you know, now the uh, tens of billions of dollars that Google, Microsoft, et cetera, are, 
our spending to uh, make sure we never have to write our, our own emails again. Um, maybe just to jump off that, like, I, w I would say that there is still a, a pretty important difference between like the kind of research labs we're seeing at corporations. Um, I think for the, for the most part, Microsoft was pretty much the only one that had like a research program where they didn't have a, you know some direct goal to convert that research into a product. Google certainly does, and, and I think most recently even Microsoft's leadership said to 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 get with the times and change the research, research lab to, to think more in terms of like, um, you know, more product oriented research. But also just on that point, from, from a comparative standpoint, like one thing I, I've been thinking about is, is, the, is the level of, like I think the, the one sort of comparative advantage that, that the US system really has um, is, is the university system, the, the sort of research system that um, I mean, if we're looking at sort of these these new fields, you know, quantum AI, um, biotech, China doesn't really have the kind of university infrastructure where a lot of this basic research is happening, and 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 to this day, the U.S. is also the sort of primary, you know, the primary place that people want to go to for higher ed, for PhDs, and whatnot. <coughs> Just speaking about that, I think that research point, uh, sorry, the education point is really interesting. I, I was thinking about the, the comparison of the different periods. Brown founded its teacher training program as a result of Sputnik. So that's when we got into teaching in order to create STEM educators. And I'll be curious to see what our educational response is to this more, well, seemingly, potentially not coordinated industrial policy and whether or not to your point, we're going to see a, a shifting in, in how we think about the university system. Um, so I'll just jump into just two comments. I mean, they, 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 they touch on different comments, uh, two comments which touch on different questions and comments that have come in over the last several minutes, which is all great. Thank you so much. Um, so one is, um, so in no particular order, one is on spending. So agreed on this question of uh, is there just sort of indiscriminate spending in the U.S. and or is it done through these kind of like incentives and so forth? I mean, I think that's right. I think that's a style of um, American sort of industrial policy uh, making, which is distinct from other places. Uh, that said, one of the critiques of industrial policy in, in China is that there's also this massive amounts of money that's being spent, perhaps even less efficiently um, than the U.S., including in some of these leading edge areas like AI and quantum. And perhaps one of the reasons why it's less efficient, just as JS was noting, is that the capacity um, uh, in terms of the sort of knowledge stock and, and sort of human talent pool and so forth um, is, is smaller um, in China than it is in the US. But nevertheless, there's still this massive amount of, of spending. Um, one other thought, thought on the spending um, maybe comes back to the infrastructure, where again, that's a, an interesting distinction between China and the US is the extent to which China has obviously um, sort of done massive infrastructure investments. Um, you know, as we all know, over the course of the last few decades, and is much more capable, uh, sort of more for political reasons, of uh, accomplishing those kinds of infrastructure investments um, uh, than the U.S. And so that was one sort of sort of uh, thoughts on on spending. Um, the others on pluralism. So I to interrupt. So I'm, I'm kind of with you as well in sort of reluctantly thinking. Oh my God, like I'm making pluralist <laughs> You liberals, <laughs> liberals. <laughs> But it's it's difficult to and this goes back to like one of the earlier questions as well or, or comments about um, sort of bipartisanship and so it's it's hard not to in the U.S. context see just the the, the tug that's happening the sort of the underlying political um, uh, sort of to and fro that's that's taking place and trying to think about how that's that's manifesting um, and one way is in this kind of like is it just about the jobs which I think that's a I think it's a big a big part of it. But a kind of, you know, another interesting way is, again, maybe it comes back to the different levels of governance and what we're seeing at the federal level, both in Congress and the White House, um, and then how it's manifesting in, in the states and then at the sort of sub-state level between different municipalities, which then brings in, and I sort of raised the point about, um, uh, from my colleague Phil Thompson about black mayors and, and race, because it brings in the kind of reality of the American political economy, which is a lot of the headline about, you know, political backlash is, of course, all kind of couched in. It's the upper Midwest, it's kind of ethno-nationalist, it's like white, white, you know, the disaffected sort of white American 
male worker and so forth. And for sure, that's an important part of it. But that misses a whole other set of the underlying political dynamics of, of the U.S., uh, which, as we all know, is like extremely fraught. Um, and it's, it's coming up, interestingly, I think, precisely through these things around the Green New Deal and the particular ways in which um, uh, um, uh, some of the spending is targeted at particular communities um, and then also the extent to which it can get there or not because it can be blocked by the states. Um, and that's raising like lots of really interesting and important uh, uh, issues, um, which is not totally materialistic, so I'll rescue um, a little bit because, again, it comes back to how is industrial policy, how is it all conceptualized, right? Um, which is like one of the key things that we, we want to, to think about as well. Okay. I also just wanted to jump in on, on the, the question of fun, on, on spending, which is that like if we're looking at a U.S.-China comparison, I, I do think we have to be like a little bit critical or, or skeptical even of, of the way that Chinese spending happens. I mean, I certainly know less about the, the climate or you know, sort of green technology and that kind of stuff, but like I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you two anecdotes. The first is... Um, when I was in, you know, when I, when I went back to China and was visiting my friend in Hangzhou, he was, I was just hanging out with him and I thought he was kind of doing, you know, he was trying to start a consumer company selling some kind of like energy ginseng type drink. Um, but when he got to Hangzhou and he was looking for office space, there was, there was this subsidy that allowed companies with the word tech in it. Um, and so he just named his company, you know, whatever drink, you know, dot tech or, you know, tech, uh, you know, and, and that basically allowed him to get that office subsidy. Um, so, you know, there, there's like, you know, that's just one example of a high degree of inefficiency in terms of, in terms of um, uh, the, the spending in China. An, an, another, another interesting one was, um, you know, I, I learned about this recently when I, when I went to the uh, Asian, the Association for Asian Studies Conference, and there was this researcher who was doing work on the digital Silk Road. And, you know, she, she had written out, like, all, you know, a, a full set of proposals saying, you know, this is what I intend to study, blah, blah, got a bunch of money for it. And, and as soon as she started getting her feet wet in, 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 in the work, she found immediately that the, the digital Silk Road kind of didn't really exist beyond, beyond the rhetoric of, of it. Um, and, you know, what, 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 she, what she found was that it was, it was kind of used as like industrial policy for sort of lagging provinces in China in sort of this you know, weird reverse way, right? Because digital Silk Road was supposed to be about expanding outwards and local province and provinces, local governments in, in, in sort of lagging provinces were sort of just using that as like a, a brand in order to get, to get more funding or to get you know, certain advantages. Um, and so you know, that's just to say that the sort of the sort of state capacity in, in, in a way is, is, is kind of, yeah, I, I, something we should be sort of critical as to about. Almost at time. I, I can't help but say it, so it's nice to know that China has leveling up <laughs> as well, because that's basically what that sounds like. Just one final um, thought on the Chinese case. There is a very good study of Chinese industrial policy, although it's not called that, which is Ling Chen's Manipulating Globalization. And her point, and this is a compliment to JS's point about the importance of the university system, I think this is the other side of that story, which is it's really hard to do industrial upgrading if you don't control the top firms and you don't control the IP. And that's what they spent a decade trying to do, is these industrial upgrading competitions, trying to make firms move up the product ladder and invent IP and all sorts of stuff, and largely it was a disaster. So what you then saw was a shift very much to strategic sectors. Like, we're going to do EVs because we know how to do that. We don't have to invent that much. We just have to make them at scale and make them affordable because Tesla doesn't do that. We know how to do solar. All those SOEs that economists in the West don't understand, watch this shit. We're going to basically crush the price on this because we've got such production capacity and we also control the polysilicon supply chain, right? So it's that kind of thing that is, in a sense, compensating for the lack of the other stuff. And that makes for a very interesting and different set of kind of like institutions you're going to do this with, in a sense. So yeah, it also ties back into um, what we're seeing about um, this crackdown on uh, these super high profile um, business actors in, in right. China. And you know, it's about forcing a reorientation of their actions towards sectors and industries that um, the CCP seems as, you know, where it wants to have more attention. I mean, areas of hardware, um, uh, as well as some of the others that you mentioned. So, yeah. Yeah, and j just quickly on, on that point, it, and it's interesting to 
to that you raise EVs because China never could really master um, producing internal combustion engines, which which sort of had this kind of like you know sort of requires deep expertise, requires sort of a complex like sort of coordination with other other countries, other supply chains, um, whereas EV is, is sort of a totally different you know situation. Yeah, exactly. You find your advantages in weird places. Yeah. Or you leapfrog. Or you leapfrog, exactly. So uh, I'd love to th thank you very much for coming along and closing the, the season, as it were. Uh, an excellent talk. Thanks to everyone else for turning up online and in person. And um, we'll see you, I guess, next semester at some point, some way, shape or form. Until then, all the best. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.